Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Eating the Elephant. For those of you unfamiliar with our series, we talk about um, we talk about the recovery process from Hurricane Michael as an elephant, and we try to break it into bite-sized bites. That's what we call, call it, Eating the Elephant. And uh, today, I spent the day um, in Tallahassee uh, talking to legislators and uh, and a couple of cabinet members, and we were talking about assignment of benefits. And bear with me for a minute, and I'm going to get onto some more specific insurance topics, but. Um, but there's been an awful lot of talk on Facebook, pro and con. You've got uh, AOB contractors and plaintiffs bar on one side, and you've got all this insurance folks on the other side. And we talk a lot uh, at each other, frankly, and we talk sometimes past and over the heads of the general public. And, and we probably should do less of that. But uh, I'm a big fan of reigning in the abuse and, uh, and such that has come along with Assignment of Benefits, or AOB. So I wanted to sort of help reassure some of you. Those of you that are having difficulty with AOB, fighting with a contractor that's misbehaving, um, help is on the way. It looks like after six years, the Florida legislature is finally going to get some, uh, some things going. And uh, there is a tremendous coalition of consumer groups, the governor's office, the CFO, the, uh, the insurance commissioner, there are lots and lots of folks. Um, one of the most compelling speakers I heard today actually was a roofer uh, from the Tallahassee area who, frankly, I think is a little embarrassed by some of the players in his field, um, some other roofers that are taking advantage of, um, of, of homeowners by using AOB and uh, maybe doing shoddy work and, uh, and probably overbilling for that work. And, and he had some pretty some pretty interesting stories, uh, both before and after, uh, the time that we spent together. And, and i I gotta tell you, um, AOB is a real problem. AOB in itself is not a problem, but the abuse is. And uh, if we can scale back the fraud and abuse, then I think we're going to be in good shape. So again, those of you that are having difficulty, um, it's kind of a Pyrrhic victory for you, I think, because, um, I, I think you're being used as an example around the state of Florida for how bad behavior can really adversely affect homeowners. And, uh, and frankly, in session, there's probably not going to be a lot of change that will be able to give you a great deal of direct help. However, uh, know that the next storm that hits, the next community, uh, they'll be in better shape. And, and I'll say this too, with this momentum moving forward, um, I think AOB contractors, those that abuse the AOB process, I think will be a little less bold and a little bit less likely to take advantage of folks. So let's get on to some more insurance topics uh, that are more particular. And, and one, especially I wanted to talk about tonight because I've gotten so many questions about it the last week, uh, some as, as recently as a couple of hours ago on Facebook, and, and there's a concern about people profiting from a claim. And there's an awful lot of chatter back and forth between homeowners that have a, um, maybe a claim from Hurricane Michael and roofers or contractors or mitigation folks that want to t try to tell people what fraud is and is not. Um, I've even seen actually some really bad advice from attorneys. And, and I would think the definition of fraud is a pretty basic uh, legal concept that, that attorneys could get. But I've even seen some, uh, some kind of shaky advice from a couple of attorneys. Um, most attorneys have, that I've seen uh, giving advice on Facebook about this have given solid advice. I don't mean that's the majority. But, but when you even get folks in the legal profession that are, that are sort of misidentifying fraud, it's a little bit discouraging. Um, the concern, to be very specific, was uh, if a homeowner is, uh, is paid $15,000 to put on a new roof and they find that roof uh, from another contractor, say, for $12,000 after they're paid, um, if they keep that $3,000, is that fraud? And I think from a legal definition, um, absolutely not would be my answer. Um, one of the key elements of fraud is intent, and I think if you were paid before you even got a bid or before you got the bid that you wanted to use, um, I, I can't see where it's even conceivable that someone could show fraudulent intent. Um, it, fraud, you, you have to take advantage of somebody or an insurance company in this case, I guess, and you have to intend to do that. You have to go out with the purpose of stealing money from an insurance company. And that's just not the case here. So I, I would say intent is a big deal. Now, if you uh, want to take that $3,000 and apply it elsewhere in your house, um, I, I think that's probably going to work. I've spoken to lots and lots of very senior insurance company personnel, and the exact situation I just described where you get paid in advance for a roof for $15,000, pay a little bit less, 
I, you're never going to be questioned really by a, a quality insurance company. There, uh, a matter of fact, we've had people. Um, I actually was one of them in in the distant past that called and said, "Hey, I've, I have this extra money. What do I do?" Um, and people are routinely being said, being told, "Look, I, it, it's more hassle for us for a small amount to take that money in." Um, than it is to just walk away from it. And, and that money can fill in cracks in other places where you maybe have a disagreement with the insurance company. You think something should be covered or it should be a different value. And instead of fighting about that, you kind of let the insurance company win on that one and you pay it with money that you've already been paid. Um, you use their money somewhere else. Now, what would be fraudulent is if you said uh, a roof is going to cost $15,000, Let's say you were paid the actual cash value of eleven or twelve thousand dollars. Let's say you got the work done for that amount, and then you submitted an inflated bill that you knew to be false to get recoverable depreciation. That's absolutely fraud. It's a third degree felony, and you certainly don't want to do it. But if you get to the end of this process and you have a few extra dollars in your pocket, um, I'm not saying you should shoot for that, but it could happen, and that's not necessarily fraud. If you go out with that intent, if you go hire somebody, uh, for example, just to get more money, money that you really don't know that you're about to, if you know that you've got forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of damage to your house, and you hire someone because they promise you they can get you a hundred thousand dollars, in in my opinion, I, I think that's fraudulent. Would you get convicted for that? Probably not in the current environment. So, is it wrong? Absolutely, I think it is. Could you get away with it? Certainly possible. But I, I need people to understand that if an insurance company pays you, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you owe that money to a contractor. What I have seen that's been a little problematic is I've seen contractors on Facebook saying, oh, you ended up with money in your pocket. That's wrong. You have to write me a check for all of the money. So if an insurance company sends you a check, if you don't spend every dime of that with that contractor, that's fraudulent. And I think that's just bullying because all that's saying is that same money is going to be spent and instead of it being in your pocket, it's going to be in the pocket of a contractor who has already agreed with you on a price to do the work that you asked them to do. So just because the insurance company is willing to pay more doesn't necessarily mean the contractor should get more by definition. If the scope of work changes, if the quality of work changes, if the inputs such as materials change, absolutely the contractor may be entitled to more money. But they're not entitled to more money just because you received more money from the insurance company. So be very, very careful about that. If you get to the end of your process and you feel like you've been overpaid and you want to do something about it, fine. Um, there are very, very simple mechanisms to do that. Frankly, most people are not going to take advantage of those mechanisms. They're going to consider that uh, like... Uh, say a $20 bill found on the sidewalk, they're going to stick that in their pocket and move on. I'm, I'm not going to take any issue with any of those people. I'm not talking about the moral or ethical implications of any of this. I'm simply talking about what's legal and what's not, what is fraudulent and what's not. So be very, very careful when somebody accuses you of fraud because they want to take money out of your pocket. So another, uh, another issue that I think we've um, had some difficulty with is somebody maybe not staying in their lane. We've had an awful lot of uh, complaints or accusations, probably is a better word, of unlicensed practice of public adjusting, UPPA. Um, I, I've seen a lot of public adjusters and, uh, and some contractors, uh, but mostly public adjusters and a couple of attorneys use this term. And, and I want to be very clear. Contractors can talk about contracting. Contractors can talk about pricing. So if somebody is at your house and they're working on your um, they're they're working on your home and they want to talk to your insurance company about um, well there needs to be another forty linear feet of um, of siding on this house or this builder's grade carpet is not what they had in this house it was a little bit more than that um, let's have a discussion about that that's perfectly appropriate what a contractor cannot do is they cannot negotiate with the insurance company. They can discuss their scope of work, and they can talk about the quality of materials, things like that. They can talk about construction items. They cannot negotiate, and they cannot try to tell you what is and is not covered. They cannot interpret your contract for you. Only a public adjuster, company adjuster, or insurance agent can do that. I'm sorry, or an attorney can do that as well. But I think I've seen a lot of um, what I consider unfounded accusations of UPPA, 
um, the unlicensed practice of public adjusting. And I think really it's, it's a little bit of a jealous turf war. So um, if, if you have questions, ask somebody that's outside the fight. Ask somebody that doesn't have a, a financial dog in your fight what they think. And, and if you can get a reasonable opinion from somebody that doesn't have a financial interest in the transaction, I think you'll be much better off. Um, uh, along with that, uh, I, I want to say that if, uh, I, I want to say trust no one, but that's, that's not appropriate. We have to trust folks these days. But there's an awful lot of misinformation. Um, I've looked at a lot of social media lately. I've looked at social media. I've listened to the radio, the TV. Just because you see something on television or see it on Facebook uh, hear it on the radio, it doesn't make it true. Um, I would tell you not to get your information from one source. I think this is good policy for everything from politics to medical advice to anything else. But if you're asking advice on insurance claims, on repairs to your home, on the process, absolutely 100% do not trust a single source. Don't trust me. Don't trust your public adjuster. Don't trust your insurance company. Don't trust your attorney exclusively. When you get this advice, you're gonna, you will hire contractors to give you construction advice. You may hire an attorney to give you legal advice. Uh, you may call me to get some insurance advice, although you wouldn't hire me, it would be free. Um, don't take a single source. I've seen so much misinformation, particularly on social media. Uh, I would say probably as much as half the information I read about insurance is just completely incorrect. Um, frankly, but that's a better ratio than it was right after the storm. So if you have questions, Ask different people, and not just different people, different types of people. Ask people from different parts of the transaction. Um, if you happen to be friends with a contractor, maybe ask a contractor and talk to an attorney, talk to an agent, talk to other people that may, um, on their face, kind of automatically disagree with one another. Get different perspectives, different viewpoints on your problem, and then make a decision on your own. If you get very, very confused, there are additional resources you can bring in. There are helplines. There is free legal help available. Uh, the uh, Department of Financial Services in Tallahassee can bring you some expertise for free. But do not, under any circumstances, simply take anyone's word as gospel. Um, always trust, but always verify. I think that's probably the better way to go. Reagan was absolutely right. I want to leave you with, uh, with one last thing. We've, we've had some folks um, that... I, I think have confused other people. Some people have gotten uh, repairs done that frankly they probably shouldn't have gotten paid for by the insurance company. For instance, if you uh, have to take out some drywall uh, because you had some water intrusion and they find say uh, rot that's obviously been there for months or years. Uh, I saw a post today about someone that had their, uh, their windows replaced because they were installed properly and they used the hurricane as an excuse uh, to say that they were damaged and they got that paid. Um, they got that paid. Absolutely, no question by the insurance company. Insurance companies, whenever there's any ambiguity, they have to pay because they get to design the contract. They get to design the process. They kind of have control of the situation. So if there's any ambiguity whatsoever in the contract or the process or the coverage, that is going to lean in favor of the client, of the insured, of the homeowner, as it absolutely should. So what I would tell you is, um, people that are saying they're getting things paid for. Um, they absolutely can do that. It doesn't make it right and it doesn't mean it's covered. Um, if you pull out a wall and you see that there's damage that's obviously been there for months or years, um, can you get an insurance company to pay for it? Sure. But if they don't, um, that doesn't make them incorrect. So I'm going to leave it there for tonight. Uh, again, uh, I think help is coming on AOB. Um, again, uh, be careful who you trust and always get additional sources. Um, and, and quit being quite so worried about sort of accidentally profiting from your claim. Whatever money you have in hand, work it out to the very end of the claims process and then see what's happened. If, if you have money left over, there are ways to deal with that. Chances are um, things may even out uh, before the very end. I want to leave you with kind of our mantra. Always, always in this process, educate, advocate, escalate, and mediate. We want you to educate yourself, advocate for yourself, um, continue to press the process, escalate it to a supervisor where necessary, and if you really, really need to, then take it to the Department of Financial Services in Tallahassee and help them, uh, or, or let them help you fix the problem. Uh, we'll leave it there. We'll see you Sunday. I hope you have a great, great week.